Hi everyone, I'm here today with conductor Jonathan Hayward and composer Hannah Kendall. Jonathan was a former LA Phil Gustavo Dudamel conducting fellow and was just recently appointed as chief, chief conductor of the Nordwest Deutsche Philharmonie. Hannah is in town for the US premiere of the Spark Catchers, which the Seattle Symphony is premiering, and it was first debuted at the BBC Proms in 2017. So I understand you two have known each other for a while. How did you, how did you first meet? I'm trying to remember this. Can I you can't remember? remember. I can't remember either. <laughs> because I feel as though we've known each other for quite some time. Yeah. We <laughs> were just talking know. yesterday about this last yeah. night, about how it's very bizarre. This is actually the first time I've been able to conduct one of her works. Oh, amazing. I was due to conduct one in Berkeley, um, but I fell ill, so I wasn't able to do it. Um, but in a very weird way, it just feels like we've known each other for a very long time, I know. actually. Yeah. So the answer to that is, I don't think we both know, but we do feel like it's been a really mm. lovely long relationship, yeah. actually, uh, a yeah. music relationship, yeah. Oh, that's beautiful. Yeah. Um, well, we're really excited that you're both here in Seattle. Anything fun that you both have experienced while you've been here so far, or do you have anything planned your top two places to go to? Well, I made lots of friends at the art museum yesterday. Mm -hmm. um, everyone's really friendly in Seattle. Yeah. And um, the art here is incredible. And I invited all the volunteers to the concert and they're um, coming on Sunday. Oh, great. So, oh, yeah. That's really great. So I highly recommend Seattle Art Museum. It's actually on my list. That's definitely it's phenomenal. the first it's thing amazing. on my list. Yeah, no, I really, that, that and uh, um, the big tall tower that you have space as well. That the one. Space, the space yes. Needle. Iconic. Yeah, mm -hmm. I feel like, oh, but I did stop by the first Starbucks today. Oh, did you? Yeah, <laughs> that was also on my list. And I, that was, I didn't oh, wait yeah. in the line. I was, I'm too impatient for that. But just to be outside of it was mm -hmm. pretty cool, oh, actually. Okay. Yeah, just to walk past it, you know, it's really, it's fun. If but it's, it's a beautiful area though. It's so lovely to walk in the Pike Market and everything else like that. It's really it beautiful. Really is very it's great. Beautiful. Yeah. If you go to the Space Needle, you have to get, um, there's like a really cheesy backdrop photo that oh, they have yeah. you take. Oh. It's, it's perfect. Oh, that's, I love those. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> that's my favorite. I like those. Great. Um, so I'm curious about how you both got started in classical music. Um, Hannah, you recently told the Seattle Times that you hadn't even imagined writing music because you hadn't seen others who looked like you and um, composing. So who exactly inspired you to start writing? Um, I studied music at the University of Exeter and um, that was incredible, but I went um, primarily to train as a singer and mm -hmm. to do all the other things required as part of a music degree and um, which amazingly enough was composition so it was compulsory for everyone to have some sort of um, composition requirement as part of the degree which was really cool and that's the first time that I really took composing seriously mm -hmm. um, because of all of the incredible teachers there who encouraged me to go for it but um, but technically, I, f I fell into it completely by mistake because they changed the credits at university <laughs> and I needed 10 extra credits to graduate. That's amazing. What a and I thought, That's oh, but um, yeah, on the one hand, it's a funny story. Um, but on the other hand, it's, it is a shame that I hadn't really thought that it was something that I could do professionally mm -hmm. um, before that fluke. But um, but I found that um, Jay Dizelle, who was the composition teacher there, just really encouraged me to go for it and to move forward and say so I'm really grateful for that. Amazing. Mm -hmm. And I often find that like composition, um, conductors often don't, you know, make their way to the podium until maybe like later in their musical yeah. careers. How did you first yeah. find your way to conducting? Gosh, uh, yeah, it was uh, like Hannah's story, very random in a lot mm -hmm. of ways. Um, I. I, um, I started as a cellist, mm -hmm. uh, and I started picking up cello when I was in fifth grade. Uh, so I was quite, what I think people would consider late bloomers, if you will, right. but uh, for cello. And and then it happened just, I was, I was in my string orchestra class, and uh, our teacher was ill, and we needed to run through the piece because the next day we had a performance. And so we did the most sensible things as school students and just put our names in a hat, <laughs> shake it about and find out who was going to conduct the orchestra through. And my name got pulled. 
uh, is the first name that got pulled. And uh, I was terrified. I hated <laughs> being in front of people. Um, I hated being the center of attention. Mm -hmm. I didn't, I it was a very shy kid growing up. Um, and I did it, but what was fascinating for me instantly was the idea of the score and how, you know, I was as a cellist just reading one line of music mm -hmm. constantly and I was responsible for one line of music, but as a conductor, you are now then responsible for all these lines. Right. And for me, that was the thing that really clicked and I suddenly knew then that I wanted to do it because I loved the idea of the collaboration and the, the, the feel of getting everything together. So it was when I was in eighth grade, basically, wow. when I had this opportunity, a bit of a fluke, as, you, as, you, <laughs> as one would say. Um, but from there on, it was, the rest is really history, because I knew from then that I wanted to become a conductor. That is an absolutely amazing story. It's hilarious, yeah, isn't it? For both of it's you. It's quite funny. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I feel like you never really, never really see that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, what is something both of you wish that you had known when starting your careers? Uh, Something that might have like helped you along the way, or I mean, I don't know how you feel about it, but I, I find that I mean, it's very like very mm -hmm. li much like the whole situation of getting into conducting. Mm -hmm. Everything has kind of been not a fluke, but everything has kind of just slightly fallen into place in a lot of ways that I'm not sure I would want to necessarily have known anything, mm -hmm. but because there were so many, I mean, and that's I guess because I was incredibly fortunate. I had a lot of great teachers who believed in me. Um, I had a lot of lovely sponsors who believed in me. And because I had their support, all these kind of flukes that came into my life, then just everything fit in some way. So I'm not, I'm not sure, I don't know, I, I don't, in a way, I don't know if I, I would, the same outcome that I, where I am today, if I would have known anything that would have actually been helpful in a way. Mm -hmm. I think it's just, in a lot of ways, just going with the mm -hmm. flow and seeing, seeing how things work. Mm -hmm. But I don't know if that's how you feel as well. I don't no, know. I think there's a great beauty in just learning things along the way. Yeah. And, yeah. and I think that's what makes um, our individual journeys and stories individual yeah. and I think that's the great thing um, because um, you know the idea of having unique artistry is really mm -hmm. important and I think that's what puts um, um, you know different musicians um, forward or or apart really or makes mm. you know what we're doing um, unique to our own experiences mm. and so I think the fact that um, you know, we fell into what we're doing yeah. almost by mistake that's yeah. actually shaped our experiences in ways Absolutely. that are completely different to anyone else's. Yeah. And so I think I would almost not have it any other way yeah. as well. And I think a part of it is why I'm so passionate in encouraging um, young girls um, and, and young people of colour of getting into classical music is mm -hmm. because of um, the unexpected experiences that I had, and had it been any other way, I probably wouldn't be so um, so passionate about that. I think, right. and so I think, as you say, yeah. it's all of those those different ways yeah. and different journeys yeah. just you know help to shape our own individual experiences. Yeah. Yeah. Beautiful. Um, so these questions are for both of you. Mm -hmm. um, when we talk about music and what music really um, expresses, it articulates a point in time, people's experiences, um, and all of those things do manifest themselves in the music that people compose and how you perform. Um, what sort of stories do you think music can tell us about the time that we live in, and why is it so important to um, support new, contemporary, different, diverse voices? Hmm. I'll give that one to you to start. Yeah. Okay then. Um, well, I think it's really important to have a diversity of voices um, for the reasons that you were alluding to mm -hmm. and also what I was just saying as well because um, the, the beauty of having different um, composers and musicians um, retelling 
either their own experiences or just simply having different viewpoints of mm -hmm. the world is what makes um, classical music and you know contemporary classical music relevant to everyone who's engaging with the works. And so, um, you know, if we just had, so for, as an example, one demographic, if we were just hearing um, the experiences of just one demographic the whole time, that's not giving a broad view of, um, of just world experiences. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's why it's so important to to, to have that diversity because, um, you know, what I think of, I don't know, current political um, aspects or a particular um, political climate will be completely different to someone else who is my contemporary. Yeah. And, and I think that's why it's just so important to mix things yeah. up. I think there's a true beauty in not only classical music, but music in general of inclusiveness and this idea of having everyone's stories and everyone's perspective. Mm. Um, because when you, you know, you see and create these different ideas, these different perspectives, what happens I think is people's minds then are expanded and mm -hmm. they're, they're allowed to kind of just see some, it's like a kaleidoscope in a way, to see something in a different way that you would never see it before. Right. And for me, that's, that's more, that, that goes beyond music, that, that goes on a kind of a simple human life thing. So these things are related, I think, you know, being able to have uh, classical music and have this inclusiveness within classical music is a human thing, mm -hmm. other than necessarily just a music thing. Absolutely. You know what I mean? Um, but yeah, and I think, and with that, I think that's why it's so important to to have inclusiveness. This idea of being able to have different um, backgrounds and and um, perspectives. How would you each um, define your identities, whether as musicians or just as human beings? Yeah. Um, or do you even like to be? defined by an identity because sometimes yeah. I often think you know identities can kind of um, yeah. silo you yeah. into one specific yeah. type of mm -hmm. thing. Yeah and I, I'm actually reading this very fascinating book called Don't Label Me mm -hmm. and um, it's all about this and definitely the world that we're living in now this kind of very weird world of tribalism where you have to be in one pack right. um, or there's no gray area anymore. Um, so for me I actually have a really a slight issue to it because yeah. I think the problem that we're living with right now um, is a very humane problem that we we don't see that we're all just humans we don't see a lot of common ground and that's yeah. our problem so when I think when we put things in boxes it becomes a bit dangerous um, for me personally I, I'm saying that having a Russian mom um, a dad from Harlem and ancestors from Yugoslavia. Like, I'm a mutt of so many things. I mean, but what am I supposed to check all these boxes? Mm -hmm. You know, I, for me, I, that doesn't, that doesn't feel right, you know, but the idea of uh, this human construct, the more that we can have like values, things like that, and bridge that gap through music, um, I think the better we are, off we are really. But yeah, so as far as labeling myself, I know, a musician maybe, but mm -hmm. I wouldn't go any further than that maybe, yeah. Yeah, um, yeah I don't mind labels. Mm. I personally, um, I, you know, I, I understand what you're saying yeah. and I think there's, um, you know, there are really, there's a really strong argument in that. Um, but personally for me, it's important um, for my own identity to, you know, I suppose boldly claim and state that I'm a black woman, and certainly in classical music. Mm -hmm. And I think, um, um, and I think that that's mostly because I don't know. I suppose, like you know, there have just been, for example, so many black women who've been written out of classical music yeah. history, yeah. Mm -hmm. and um, and and it's such an incredible journey that I'm on at the moment and it would be 
so sad to think that in 200 years or however many years that I might be written out of history because of my very identity. Mm. And so, um, and so I think I need to think a bit more deeply about it, but I think that's certainly part of that. And, and I think also that's part of my unique artistry that I was right. um, talking about earlier. And I think it's great that I have this opportunity to um, reconcile my African Caribbean heritage within um, a Western classical idiom. You know, that's really cool. And to be able to find new ways to, to bring that to the primarily Western classical platform. Yeah. And so I think that's where my viewpoint comes. Um, but also, you know, on the other hand, I want the freedom to be able to state my own identity and I don't want others to to put me in a specific silo or, or in a box and yeah. I think that's where yeah. the the difficulties come and yeah. it's really up to me to how to um, to present it yeah. in the way that I want to. Yeah. Absolutely. Well said. Um, Hannah can you share a little bit more about the spark catchers and um, what what the piece is what the piece is about? Yeah um, it's, I really loved writing it, um, mostly because I had, two years before I wrote The Spark Catchers, I'd been writing about um, Martin Carter, who was a Guyanese, an incredible Guyanese writer and poet and political activist, but he went on a hunger strike for a month in prison. And so that's wow. what I'd been writing about over two years. <laughs> <laughs> and then this opportunity to write a great celebratory piece <laughs> came up with the prompt and I was like, yes, <laughs> I would like to do that, please. Yeah. And so um, it was written for a great occasion um, um, for Chineke um, and their debut prom in 2017. And um, the orchestra is made up of majority um, minority musicians and it was just such um, a vibrant and fun and celebratory occasion and so when I was looking for um, um, inspiration for the piece um, I had been reading Lem Sisse's collection of poems and he is an incredible poet who I've admired for so many years. And the, the Spark Catchers, um, the, the poem that's based on the workers who worked in the Brian to May match factory, um, just completely jumped off the page. And because it was written for, the, um, it was, um, Lem was commissioned to write it for the 2012 Olympics, which in the UK was um, such, so the London 2012 Olympics, mm -hmm. and I'm a lifelong Londoner. Um, yes, <laughs> although I live in New York now, so it's, uh, oh, yeah. I know. <laughs> and so, um, and I just remember how proud London was to host the Olympics and and, and so that's why I was particularly drawn to it, but also all of the multi-layers within the poem and things, other things that I'm interested in. Um, so it's about the primarily Irish immigrant workers who worked at the factory, working in appalling conditions, and they were the first group of workers to ever go on strike against um, poor working conditions, and they won their case. Um, and so there's the aspects of social justice and immigration, but the fact that they worked in this factory that was on, that was at one time on the Olympic Park in London. So just all these things came together and um, the words are just, and phrases are so evocative that it was just so easy to, um, to um, set those phrases and words to music. Mm. And, just, and the title as well, The Spark Catchers, it's so mm -hmm. cool. Um, <laughs> it is. It's, it's a really intriguing really title. Really yeah. Yeah. It really is, it really is. It's so good. And yeah. it comes from the fact that they literally had to keep watch yeah. for the sparks yeah. and catch them so that the, um, the factory wouldn't burn down. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, and so yeah, there yeah. many, many aspects, yeah. That's <laughs> yeah. What do you think makes Hannah's music so special? Or why were you so drawn to it? 
performing it. Yeah, I mean, I, I've i raved to her about this beforehand, but the idea that her scores are incredibly crystal clear on the paper, and for me, it's, it's, it's so, it's a relief to see that because I've I've worked on a lot of I've worked on a lot of contemporary work, um, and to just have it there and understand what exactly she wants, it's so clear. So it's, it then makes it easier to just make music, um, mm -hmm. which is lovely, um, but also the really great sense of atmosphere. Um, she takes us on these different journeys with these different phrases from the poems, basically. And you, you, you clearly understand which journey you're at in, in the whole overall structure mm. of the work. So then by the end of it, you, you really get a sense of, of a whole arc. Um, and for me, that's, that's really special writing to be able to do that and then have this, this sense of atmosphere as well on top of it, really very carefully thought out orchestration as well to get these different soundscapes um, that are really special. And I always just hope that we get them whenever we perform oh. it. Um, but it's all on the paper. And for me, that, that's, that's, that's you know, composing at its very highest level for me. So Aww. you know, I really, I think it's, I think it's really special Aww. to be able to to work on a piece like this with her. Really, cool. it's great. We are both so very excited that you are here conducting the U.S. Mm -hmm. debut mm -hmm. of the Spark Cashers with the Seattle Symphony, um, and we'll leave you with an excerpt of this performance. So thank you both so much for being here. Thank, thank you very you. much. <laughs>